If you have your Bible with you this morning, we are in Romans 15. Just two chapters left here in the book of Romans. I want to remind you that next Sunday is the end of daylight saving time. So that is fall back next Saturday night. That's the good one, right? There's one we celebrate and one that we dread. This is the one we get to celebrate, even though I don't like it getting dark so early. But Make sure you set your clock back next week or be here early. That's, that's up to you. There are scientists that have been studying for a long time to try to find out the answer to a question that I am sure every single one of you have asked, and it is simply this. Why do geese honk? <laughs> yes, there are a team of scientists that are studying geese language, It must take a special calling, but they have studied why geese honk. And what they have figured out is, is that they have different honks for different situations. Now, you know, the geese, now again, we don't, we don't get fall down here, but in some places, birds fly south because of fall. Anyway, the geese that are flying, they're flying in their formation and the geese in the front honk a certain way to tell the whole flock which way they're going to go. Okay, so there's a navigation honk. And then there are some further back that have a different honk, and their job is to watch for danger, for predators, okay? And then the ones in the back have a different honk. And their honk, according to these scientists, are honks of encouragement to the ones that are leading because they know that the ones in the front bear more of the load, allowing the ones in the back to fly with the flock and rest. Scientists, I guess these same guys, have have figured out that when geese fly in formation, they fly 70% more efficiently. So 70% faster, and they take 70% less energy to get to where they're going. And you're like, what in the world, right? I know two weeks ago, we kind of just blitzed over chapter 14 in a couple sentences. In chapter 14, Paul is writing to the church because they're struggling with each other. They're struggling to to blend cultures and backgrounds. And in that struggle, they were starting to maybe think, well, if you act like this, you're not a Christian. If you act like this, you're not a Christian. And so you had these believers that came out of the Jewish tradition that were still following the law and they were still celebrating the holy days because that's what they had grown up with. And they were doing it for Christ, but they were, they were doing that. And then you had some over here that had come out of the Roman pagan gods and they had all their ceremonies where they like, Uh, sacrificed an animal and then ate the meat and then had a big party. And so those folks are over here and they're like, look, we're not going to touch that stuff. We're not going to touch the meat. We're not going to touch those days. We're going to, we're not going to celebrate any of it because it reminds us of who we used to be. And then you've got this group in the middle. That's probably the largest group that was just the believing church. And And they're like, we don't understand why you're doing this. And we don't understand why you're doing this. And so Paul is encouraging them. And he says, look, you got to bear with each other in this journey. Not everybody is, is, they all have the core belief of Christ, but they're all kind of coming at it from their own perspective. And let me delineate there. They are all coming to Christ, right? That's the non-negotiable. He's like, bear with the ones who say, I can't eat that meat. Or these over here that say, we celebrate this festival because we're all trying to follow Christ. And so chapter 15 kind of lands that plane, okay? He's going to wrap up this discussion. And he says, we who are strong, now that's those who are following Christ, who found the freedom in Christ, ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. The ought here is, is the same word that is used for a debt, like a monetary debt. And so he's like, we owe a debt to bear with the failings of the weak. Now, we don't owe a debt to the weak. 
we owe the debt to Christ, right? The one who was strong, who bore the ultimate debt for those of us who were weak in sin. He says, because of that, because of Christ, we should help carry the failings of the weak. The, the same word there is the same word that we're challenged to pick up our cross and follow Jesus with. Philippians 2 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Paul says it this way in Galatians, carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So he doesn't just say like tolerate or look down on. He says to help them carry it, this burden, so that we don't have our own self-interest in mind, but the interest of the body. I certainly have seen over time, in, I've been in churches and have seen other churches that have used phrases like, well, I, I just can't believe you're a Christian if you fill in the blank, right? Like at one point it was, well, you can't be a Christian if you go to one of those churches that has screens, that used, that used to be a thing. Before that, it was, uh, what are those, those things? Uh, overhead projectors, right? You didn't have a screen, you just put it on the wall. Before that, it was flannel graph. Some of you are old enough to remember flannel graph. But you can't be a Christian if you, if you have the words up on a screen. You can't be a Christian if you have drums on stage. Heard that one. In fact, in my very first church, there was a sweet, dear lady who paid one of the teenagers like 15 bucks a week to carry the drums off the stage during the prayer. Because we, Brad, was it, Brad knows, we, uh, is more than 15? Oh, 50? Gosh, I should have taken that job. That's a lot of money back then. It distracted her worship. Goodness gracious, I'm going back thinking, I should have done that. Yeah, she didn't matter to her, but... But she was convinced that we, we, we could not study God's word if there were drums on the stage. Now, she was okay during the worship, but not during the, the preaching, right? I've heard you can't be a Christian if you don't use the King James. I, I, I've heard, I mean, you can't be a Christian if you don't wear a suit to church. I mean, I, these are all things that I have heard from people. Now, look, there's nothing wrong with the King James. There's nothing wrong if you don't want to worship with a screen or you do want to worship with a screen or you don't want drums or you do want, like, I think that's what Paul is saying here. He is saying, don't let your personal conviction become the conviction of Christ. Because that's just selfishness, being masked as Christianity. Look, if, if the answer if we say you can't be a Christian if, and the answer is anything other than you're not trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior, then you're adding to Scripture. Then the reality is a lot of things that we find as um, doctrine, I won't say doctrine, that's not a great word, but or, or as orthodox, that's a better word, in our church are really just our traditions that have been elevated over time. And that's, the Bible is the source of truth. Brad and I both have a friend who's a missionary in Kenya. And when we go and worship with him, it's nothing but drums and people dancing the whole time. And it's amazing. He, that guy has a son who is also a missionary, but he's a missionary to surfers. It's a, it's a great idea. He travels the world where the waves are good and he surfs alongside these guys and then he invites them to Bible study and they can do it right there on the beach. And that doesn't look anything like what we're doing, but it's the gospel. And so I think what Paul is saying to the church in Rome here is, what are you honking about? Like, honk about the right things. We should honk 
That's what he's about to tell us. We've just got to know the right way to do this. He says, each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. Now, to please doesn't mean that whatever our neighbor says is right. That's not the context here. The context is to look out for the good of our neighbor. The word is edification, to build them up. Ephesians 4, Paul says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. It's this idea of honk, but make sure that as you are building up the body of Christ, that what you have to say looks to the example of Jesus, verse three, for even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So he says, look, we have scripture, we have the example of Christ, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So we are going to honk for hope. We are driving people through building them up, not tearing them down, building them up so that we can live in this encouragement and endurance. I will never forget, I had a little old lady in my very, very first church, my college church in, in Marlin, Texas. I doubt you've ever been there, but you've driven by the sign probably. And uh, she came up to me and she said, young man, I just got to tell you something. Okay. She said, the best time of gossip that we have in this church is prayer time. And I can't tell if she was for that or against it. But her point was well made. Like lots of talk that was under the umbrella of edification that turned into trying to tear each other down. I think I've told you this before, but at that same church, I was leading a youth thing on a Wednesday night one time and two girls were mad at each other because one of them had stolen the other one's boyfriend. And so we closed the prayer circle and they began to use prayer requests to call out the other one. Well, I pray for her because she was kissing my boyfriend at the, at the county fair last Wednesday night. Well, I pray for her because I don't know how she knew I was kissing her boyfriend because she was so drunk at the county fair. And, like there, and I'm just like, amen, amen, stop. <laughs> Not mutual edification. But man, we have to watch ourselves because we can so easily say that we are trying to be for someone when actually all we're trying to do is point out their flaws to other people and building ourselves up by making other people look worse. Paul says we have to follow the example of Jesus and scripture to build each other up. And then he has my second favorite prayer in this chapter. I love both of these prayers because I just love the way he structures them. He says, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus Christ had. So this is what he is praying for, right? God who gives perseverance and patience and the ability to bear with the circumstances of life. That is a gift of God toward us that he calls us to live in, right? Book of James you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So God gives the gift of endurance, of perseverance, and perseverance's job is to grow us in our faith. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Like, if we need more understanding in order to persevere, which is a gift from God, we just have to ask. Author of Hebrews says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, 
the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right at the right hand of the throne of God. The prophet Isaiah said, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary or tired. In his understanding, no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the powers of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not be faint. Every person in here who is a runner knows that point that you are running and your brain goes to war. And half of it says, you must stop. You can't go any further. You have reached the end of what you can do. And then the other side of your brain, which is saying, keep going, keep going. No, you can do more. Push through. We have that same thing going on in our head when it comes to our walk with Christ. I just, I, man, I'm just, I, I keep failing. I, I'm struggling. I don't know if I can get through this. I don't, know if I, can, I don't know if I can handle this. And then the Holy Spirit's saying, no, keep going, keep going. That's the God of perseverance. It's a gift from him. He is also the God of encouragement. Now, there's different kinds of encouragement for different things. For example, when I have kid, little kids and they are about to touch a hot stove or walk out in front of a bus, my encouragement is going to sound a little grumpy, right? Stop it! Wait! No! No! I remember very clearly when Katie was very little, she was about to step in front of a car and I grabbed her and said, no. And she just turned around, you don't like me anymore. And I'm like, sweetheart, I like you so much that I had to holler to get your attention because you were about to really hurt yourself. And I, I think that that's the voice when we think of God's encouragement that we most likely picture. Stop it don't. Okay, you're right. But then sometimes we're like, you don't like me anymore. But we wouldn't use that same voice to our toddler that's learning to walk, right? Walk. <laughs> Come on, stupid, walk. Why, why do you, why are you not walking? You should be walking by now. Get up. I'm tired of carrying you. I hope that's not your strategy. Those of you who did baby dedication last week, I hope that was covered in the baby dedication class. No. What do we do? You can do it. You can, come on. I'm right here. I've got you. I'm just one step. I've got you. Oh, that's so good. You're trying. Oh, you're, you were almost there. You're doing so good. How many of you hear that voice when you think about God speaking encouragement over you? Very few of us. And yet that's who he is. He's a perfect father. What father has a child that asks for a fish and they give him a snake? What father has a child that asks for bread and they give him a stone? That's what Jesus said. And he said, in the same way, you're a heavenly, perfect Heavenly Father gives good gifts to his children. How would your perspective on your walk with Christ change if you heard the true voice of encouragement? But you can do it. I'm right here with you. Oh, good man, good. Oh, you're almost there. Instead of, you dummy. Why do you keep doing that? You should be further along by now. We've got to get to a place where we hear God with his real voice. It's the voice of encouragement. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. 
very misquoted verse, comes after Paul says, my life is really, really hard. But I keep on because of God's encouragement. Second Timothy, the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. He is the God of endurance, and he is the God of encouragement. And Paul says, in light of who God is, right? That's why I love these prayers. In light of who God is, I am asking him to give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. Sacrificial, humble, bearing with others, following Jesus and leading others. Paul is very quick to say, don't follow me, follow me as I follow Jesus, right? I'm trying to follow Jesus and so follow me as I follow Jesus. He says, man, God can give you a spirit that gives you the same attitude toward each other that Jesus has toward us. So that with one mind, some translations say one heart, one passion, and one voice, which would be the voice of truth, if we're following Jesus, it's his voice, not ours, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, this is why I love these these two prayers in Romans 15 so much. May the God who is this, the God of encouragement and endurance, give you what you need, which is to have the same mind as Christ Jesus toward each other for the purpose of a unified passion and a unified voice that brings glory to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not to themselves, not to the church, just the Father. The only source of hope and change that will last. It was very easy for them to think that their way was better than everybody else's And the more you start thinking that your way is right, the more attention you bring on yourself. The more we start thinking his way is right, the more attention we bring to him. Accept one another then. This is is kind of his summary statement of the last two chapters. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. So, in light of bearing with one another, in light of Christ bearing with us, in light of the encouragement and endurance of the Father, (coughs) excuse me, he says accept, which the word there is grasp. It's like extend the hand of friendship, okay? In the same way that Christ extended his hand toward us, to pull us out of sin and in relationship with the Father, we too then should extend that same hand of grace to each other in order to bring praise to God. And he says, this is for everyone. (coughs) For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And he reminds them of these promises. This is Psalm 18. That moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for this mercy, as it is written, therefore I'll praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. And again, Deuteronomy 32, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. And again, Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all the people extol him. And then again, Isaiah chapter 11, the root of Jesse will spring up the one who will rise to rule over the nations In him, the Gentiles will hope. And so he's reminding both audiences. God knew from the beginning of time that he would blend traditions and cultures, preferences, 
into one body who may look at things differently, but share the same truth that the only hope we have is in Jesus Christ. And that expression looks very different all over the world, but it is expressing one hope. One hope that Jesus Christ is our only way. And then he ends this section with my favorite prayer in Romans that we will talk about next week in more detail. But it's that idea, again, that God is a God of hope and that what he wants is to fill us with joy and peace so that we overflow. He says, God gives you what you need to exist together so that you overflow to a lost and dying world. Jew, Gentile, slave, free, man, woman, festival follower, ex-pagan, strong, weak, what they all share is faith in Jesus Christ. So the answer to the question that was Paul supposed in chapter 14 about how are we all gonna get along was not be quiet. It was honk. But instead of just making noise, we need a purpose behind it. And it may be to show somebody else the direction to follow Christ. It may be to tell someone else there's danger out there. It may be just to encourage the person in front of you and say, man, your path is making my life easier right now. It's to encourage and to help each other persevere. 